Hey all, Tom here, yours truly, the Racing Joker, and we are back with another vehicle importation video. Woo! In today's episode of Car Top is Explained, we are going to be covering the process of what goes into us Americans getting our hands on our dream JDM cars. I am going to present this information in a sequence based on complexity so that it is useful for everybody. You'll see what I mean as I get into it. Also, by the way, big shout out to Sean Morris of Top Rank, who spoke on the phone with me for a couple of hours to help make sure the information in this video is verified and complete. So be sure to check out his Instagram, the Top Rank page, and of course, the main website, importavehicle.com, and also you can check out their Japan stock as well. So anyways, let's say you've decided to get a JDM car. At the most complicated level, you're going to probably know what you want in terms of make and model, as well as maybe either the color, badge, or condition it's in, in terms of whether it's stock or modified, or the number of miles, or its price. So let's say you want a white 1999 R34 GTR for under $75,000 in fairly stock condition. Well, whether you're doing this by yourself or you're doing it with the help of a company like Top Rank, which is what I recommend, you're going to check a few places where you might be able to source the car you're looking for. The first and most obvious is the Japan car auctions. There are a few upsides and downsides with the auctions. The grading system is really good, but not perfect. Typically with cars like GTRs, you'll see grades such as R, 2, 3, and 4. 4 is supposed to mean immaculate condition, stock, undamaged, you get the idea. And three and two are lesser versions of these with imperfections, damage, rust, dents, whatever. R is used for cars that have undergone repairs. And the issue with that is that even small repairs can earn an R grade, which I think can deter a lot of people from an otherwise really good deal. And like I said, the system is good, but not great. Both Sean and I have seen some high grade cars that didn't deserve the praise. That said, if you're working with a company like Top Rank, which again I recommend because they can take care of so many things an individual will get overwhelmed with, they can inspect the car in Japan in person to verify if the car is worth the purchase. So anyways, let's say you see a car on the auction that you want. Well, you'll have to bid for it. And just like with any other auction, you have to win. Which means you can either lose the auction or go very over budget. Another type of source that you and the company you're working with will definitely be scouting are car dealerships in Japan. You should never limit yourself to just one area of search. If you're looking for something specific, really specific, you've got to broaden your search to not just cover the auctions, but also other showrooms too. There are some nice cars hiding out there under the radar from the rest of us. But hey, maybe you're not as picky as the rest of us. Maybe all you want is a nice condition R34 that I want to bring to the US when it turns 25 years old. Well hey, more power to you. It certainly makes your search and Top Rank's job much easier. Because if you're working with a company like Top Rank, other companies are available, but come on, Sean talked to me on the phone for two hours, so I gotta shout out him and his people. If you're working with a company like Top Rank, they'll have a stock of cars in Japan or in the US that you can just buy and drive off the lot. Well, maybe not so much for the Japan stock, unless if you live there, but more on that later. So let's say I decide I'm not so picky. Instead of saying, I want an M-Spec NUR, I settle for just a decent condition R34 GTR that I can play with. Well, hey, I can check the Japan stock, and lo and behold, there is a gorgeous GTR with a T78 turbo kit, and it is ready to go for just under 70 grand? God, I gotta check those black market organ prices again. Or maybe you all should go to my Patreon. <laughs> I, no, I can't. I can't do that with a straight face. I can't even bring myself to say that as a joke. Okay, anyways. Whew. Okay, anyways. Now that you've found your car and paid for it, whether it's from the auction, a dealer that had just what you wanted, or it was the first car you saw that looked like the best deal for you, now you've got to worry about bringing it into the U.S., but alas, unfortunately the car we've picked, the R34 GTR, is not 25 years old yet. Which means we can't import and register it on US roads yet. We have to wait until 2024 for that. And there are only two legal exceptions to that. If your car is a MotorX car and was grandfathered into the US system nearly 15 years ago, I covered the whole MotorX story in a previous video, 
or if your car is eligible for show and display. And there are only two versions of the R34 GTR that are eligible, the Midnight Purple 2 cars and the M-Spec NERS, both very rare and expensive compared to the more common versions. As I said, these are the only legal exceptions. Don't mess with that state title nonsense. It doesn't work. You'll lose your car. The dealer who imported and originally sold the car will get busted. And then everyone who ever bought a car from them will be tracked down. And ugh. It's not good for anyone. You can't bring the car in disassembled as a kit car. And you can't bring it into the country saying it's for off-road use or race use only. You need a letter from the manufacturer to verify that. Otherwise, you and your car aren't getting very far. So please, if you've got the money to do this, do it legally, stop getting cars seized and crushed, you're not helping yourselves or anyone else. Oh, and quick note, anyone who tries to spread misinformation will either get corrected or have their comments deleted because when it comes to saving people from getting screwed over, freedom of speech isn't recognized over here. So if you think you got a shortcut, just stick to cutting corners and need for speed. <clears throat> okay, rant over. You got your car. Let's say you stored your car and now it is turn 25 and it is time. Time to take her home. Now, if you're working with a company like Top Rank, you have a lot less to worry about in terms of logistics, paperwork, and just brain power required to handle everything as an individual. For starters, Japan doesn't, strictly speaking, have a physical title document that shows your ownership of the car. It's saved in an online database instead. Once registered, you can generate what is called a deregistration certificate or export certificate depending on how it is translated from Japanese, I imagine. This document essentially serves as a, a travel ticket for your car, to put it simply. You've got three options for how you can transport your new car from Japan to the US. The most common and reasonable option is called Roro, aka Roll On, Roll Off. Basically, think of it like a car ferry, but it's like the Darth Vader Super Star Destroyer version where it's a big parking structure. The second option is that you can ship it via container, this can cost a little more, and depending on you, the car, or the situation, this option could have some advantages to you. The third and final option is to fly your car to the US. And this option is the least common because, well, it's incredibly expensive. But if you can afford to buy a $70,000 car and then spend 20 grand to fly your car to the US, obviously, there's nothing stopping you. But most of us can't or won't do that because we can't justify the expense just to get something a little sooner. It's like buying playtime and mobile games. Like, why? Why? You can't justify it. So 24 hours before the car is shipped, you need to file what is called an ISS, or a 10 plus 2. An electronic document that basically gives customs a heads up of what is coming. Another document is called the BOL, or the Bill of Lading. It basically shows who shipped it out in Japan and who is authorized to collect it. And now you want to be careful with this because you actually need this document to prove you can even collect the car. You actually need the document physically. So make sure there's some coordination there if you're doing this all yourself. Again, if you've got a company like Top Rank handling this for you, you probably don't need to worry about this. There are a lot of other documents and instead of trying to explain all of them and their purposes and failing horribly because I, I have no idea, I'm just going to list a few before moving on to the next step. We've got the H67, the 7501 customs document, and the 3520-1, which is an EPA form. As an outsider who knows nothing about this stuff, all these numbers just make me think of the code names stormtroopers get. 3520-1. TK421, why aren't you at your post? Okay, anyways, now your car is in the country. And I should say, different ports do go about things differently and have different regulations. Some ports are likely going to require that you have an escort when you're on the premises. And if you're doing this as an individual, it's probably better you come prepared with a way to transport the car. Because there's always the possibility the car won't start. And depending on how willing the port is to work with you, you may have to leave the car there until you can come back with someone who has a TWIC. Uh, a transportation worker's identification card so that they can load up and drive the car out of there, or when you get a battery charger or something. I'd recommend just getting a truck company to get your car out of there and then check the car in a garage with all the tools you need. But again, if you're already having a company like Top Rank handle everything for you, this is just background knowledge of stuff you don't have to worry about. Now comes the fun part, or the funny or awkward part, depending on how you take it. Now you must register your car. 
And every state does stuff differently. So your state could either be really easy or really tricky. Roll the dice and let's see. For the most part, everything should be fine. If you've got top rank helping you out, that can really smooth out the process. The only thing Sean really told me to look out for was to make sure things like VINs get entered correctly and that people are reading the VIN plates correctly. He also told me some stories of people either not accepting VINs from certain times or countries because they had the wrong number of digits or misreading the VIN plates. US VINs have 17 digits. Japanese cars have 11 digits. That's how it is. That's what needs to be entered. It's valid. If the DMV tries to say otherwise, you gotta do a Karen and speak with a supervisor. And here's something I wouldn't have thought of, but Sean told me. There have been a few cases where when trying to register the JDM cars, like in S13 Sylvia, for example, the model year got messed up. You see, on the VIN plate of something like an S13 or an R34 or whatever, you've got all sorts of information. You've got the VIN, the model number, color code, engine code, and engine displacement. The displacement of the SR20 DET is listed as 1998 on the VIN plate. Someone who doesn't know what they're looking at might think that's the model year, which is obviously a problem. For starters, your S13's model year could be, let's say, 1991, and the year has just been changed to 1998, which could get you in a lot of trouble for misrepresenting a car for being newer than it actually is, which could make selling the car very risky and cause all sorts of other trouble. And of course, make sure the VINs match between what's on the plate and the papers. I know that's probably obvious, but still. Basically, keep an eye out for things like that and just be observant. And obviously, again, if you're working with top rank, the process is much smoother and takes less stress from you, the customer. But that's it. Once your car is registered and insured, you're good to go. You can now enjoy your JDM car on US roads. The R32 GTR is already old enough, the R33 GTRs just started turning 25, and we're only four years away now from the R34 GTRs turning 25 as well. And man, that T78 GTR is making me impatient. Like, hurry up. I need to borrow the Infinity Gauntlet from Thanos so that I can speed things up. Unlimited power, and that's what I would use it for. Snap. <laughs> Well, anyways, thank you all so much for watching today's episode of Car Topics Explained. And thanks again to Sean Morris of Top Rank for helping make this video possible. As much as I love talking about the M3 GTR, video games, movie cars, and all that, I grew up with tuner cars before I knew anything else, and covering JDM will never get old for me. There's nothing else like it. But, I should say, this video is similar to some of my other uploads. So if you liked this video, then check out the rest of my series, Car Topics Explained. I've done many episodes talking about importing cars into the US, lots of Skyline content. Beyond that, I've done episodes covering movie cars, video game cars, race cars, rare cars, and much more cars. <coughs> and here's a cool teaser. Sean can hook us up with some cool info on the RB26 powered Mustang from Tokyo Drift. So keep an eye out for that in a future episode. Beyond Car Topics Explained, I do vlogs, car reviews, I have a series documenting my adventures, modifying and buying my own cars, and I do gaming. So if any of that interests you, then have a peruse through my channel, and hey, if you like what you see, then hit that subscribe button, and the faster you subscribe, the faster we hit 100k. And the moment the channel hits 100k, I will do a full breakdown of the first Fast and the Furious movie. I'll be talking about the cars, how they were built, the actors, the filming techniques used in the film. I'll be talking about Craig Lieberman and his involvement, Sean Morris, and so much more. So if you love The Fast and the Furious and want to know everything you can about the first film, hit that subscribe button. Do it. But anyways, that's enough from me. I, Tom the Racing Joker, am signing out. I'll see you all next time. Take it easy and keep it crazy.